Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unpacking the Exhibition, Loss and Healing. This is our third in a series of events to support our winter exhibition titled Sorrowfulness, a Reflection on Mourning, that's now on view in the GVSU Art Gallery in the Performing Arts Center here on the Allendale campus. Um, before I jump in too far, I want to say welcome to you all and thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to our guests, Melissa and Brianna. I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, I want to quick, real quick share some Zoom etiquette. Um, we'll be screen sharing today like I am here now. So if you're not already using um, the grid view or show thumbnail for the views of individuals, I recommend that as the best way to view this, especially when Brianna is sharing her presentation about her work so that you can see a full screen. Um, and then Brianna and Melissa will be pinned to the top of your Zoom windows screen so you'll still see their faces. Um, if you'd like to share your video, we welcome you to do so, especially at the end when we open it up to questions, uh, and we ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentations. All right, so I'm going to share with you a little bit of information about the exhibition and about the art gallery department on campus. If you haven't yet been to see the exhibition, Sorrowfulness, we do have an interactive virtual 3D tour that's available on our website. You'll see a little video of this in just a second. You're also welcome to see the exhibition in person in the Performing Arts Center Gallery through April 1st. That's a Friday, just a couple weeks left to see it. Um, you can find all this stuff as well as our gallery hours and some learning resources and a really interesting reading list of books that you can get through the Grand Valley Library all on our website. And I think Katie, my super helper, is gonna drop a link to that in the chat for you. I also wanna briefly mention, for those of you that are new to art gallery events, that the GVSU Art Gallery actually serves the entire university community across all campuses. GVSU holds the second largest art collection in the state of Michigan. Artwork is thoughtfully curated into every university building. If you're a student or staff or faculty member, you've probably noticed this. We believe that visual art viewing experiences have the power to spark conversations, action, and reflection on core themes of social justice, human rights, and empathy that align with the university's values of liberal education. So today I am really thrilled to welcome our speakers, Brianna hernandez Bauerichter and Melissa van der Zijden. They're here to discuss their own experiences with loss and how we navigate through loss and move toward healing. The intent of this conversation is twofold. First, to put the artwork in this exhibition that you're seeing here into context, and second, to use the artwork in general themes as a launch pad into deeper conversations about loss and healing. So before I introduce our guests, which I'll do in a moment, I want to share with you some of the artwork from the exhibition, especially for those of you that haven't had a chance to see it in person. So this exhibition features the work of three metalsmith artists, Renee Zettel Sterling, who's also a GVSU professor, professor in the visual and media arts department, teaching jewelry and metalsmithing, as well as Sue Amendolora and Adrian Grafton. Renee's work in this show, which is what you're seeing here, is the culmination of a decade's worth of reflection on the death of her brother. In her work, she utilizes her brother's clothes alongside precious metals and casts of hands and faces to create wearable objects, sometimes wearable, sometimes not, that uh, represent gestures of comfort and empathy. Sue Amendolora's work reflects upon the loss of both family members and close friends over many years. She combines common objects like scissors, um, and casts in sterling silver of funeral flower clippings into objects that represent both connections to loved ones and the desire to let go. Adrian Grafton, which is the work you're seeing here, creates larger scale sculptures that reference her relationship with her mother that she lost in 2014. Um, this circle of balloons, for example, includes 69 balloons, as well as a handcrafted dart that referenced the 69 years her mother um, lived, and also the fragility of life. Uh, the circular form of the balloons references funerary wreaths. 
Together, these three artists represent very personal relationships with loss and healing. And today we're going to unpack those ideas to better understand and give language to the experience of grief. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, take us back to the Zoom format for a moment to introduce our speakers. Uh, and I'll kick things off with Brianna. Brianna Hernandez Bauerrechter is a Chicana artist, curator, educator, and death doula guided by socially engaged practices. Brianna's artwork focuses on the experience of providing end of life care, grieving processes and mourning rituals based on her lived experiences, cultural research and collaborations with others in the field. In addition to formal artworks, her practice offers workshops and takeaway resources for viewers to self-educate through the safety of the creative process. Brianna holds a master's of fine arts degree from Kendall College of Art and Design with a focus in drawing and a bachelor's degree in arts management from Columbia College, Chicago. Brianna proudly serves as board treasurer at Walker's Point Art Center for the Arts, Walker's Point Center for the Arts in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, she's a committee member for, I'm gonna butcher this, Brianna, I'm sorry, Gente Chicana. You can hey, Chicana, so I'm West Chicana. Thank you. Um, Arts Fund of the Greater Milwaukee Foundation and as board secretary at Ma's House and by Park Art Studio on the, I'm not going to say this right either, I should have asked you, Shinnecock? You got it, Shinnecock Nation. Thank you. Uh, reservation in Southampton, New York. Melissa Vanderzijden, also joining us, is a therapist and former school social worker with over 20 years in public education. Melissa considers it a privilege to journey alongside children and families, providing short-term interventions and support for individuals experiencing family changes, academic struggles, social learning challenges, as well as grief, loss, and trauma. Melissa works with individuals from childhood through adolescence and adulthood and offers a compassionate and holistic approach that is client-centered, strengths-based, and solution-focused. Melissa holds a master's in social work degree from the University of Michigan and a bachelor's degree from Hope College with a social work major. In 2005, Melissa experienced the unexpected loss of both an infant son and her husband, experiencing her experience of living and moving forward with grief guides much of the work that she does with her clients. She considers it an honor and a privilege to hold space for the deeply personal and sacred expression, expression of grief with those who find themselves navigating through their own journey. So thank you both for being here. I'm going to pass it over to Brianna to get started and remind everyone that the chat is open for questions that we'll address at the end. And at the end, you're also welcome to take yourself off mute or raise your hand and we'll take questions that way too. Brianna. Thank you so much, Amanda. Can everybody see my screen here? Thumbs up. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you for the warm introductions and um, thank you for having us as well. I'm so excited to be part of this discussion, especially knowing that it's part of programming for an important exhibition with such other amazing artists. So it's an honor to be in good company. Um, and I'm glad you're all joining us today to expand on that discussion even more and look at healing aspects of these topics. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I'm an artist and a curator. And so I always like to start off when I talk about my work with how I got to this topic. And that's through the idea that as a curator, I've always had the opportunity really gratefully so to work with other artists who've dealt with difficult life circumstances and transform them into tools of education and empathy building and as a way to connect through that hardship. And after becoming a caregiver for my mother in the final year of her life, I knew I had to do the same thing with my own work, not only for my own healing, but also to support others who've been through and are going through similar circumstances. What did I learn from that that I could extend to others as an offering of just a tiny bit of relief and comfort and companionship going through those moments. So I like to share this slide of my, myself with my mother on the right and then her altar that's in the middle now that I have with other family members who've also passed on as a introduction to what inspires all of my artwork and you know the meaning behind it has 
this deep connection that is both personal, cultural, and also thinking um, the more broadly in an altruistic and communal sense. I started off my artwork on grief from that personal aspect. What is the raw emotion that I'm dealing with in this moment? And how do I express that when I don't necessarily have the right words and I'm feeling so many things at once? So I started a series of videos that are incorporating more uh, performative and theatrical uh, settings in order to communicate those raw emotions in a physical way. And then I set them into these installation or vignettes to also create an environment for people to experience them in. So in this one, you can see that the video that's in the film still in the center is actually featured on this tiny picture frame on top of a dresser that has my mother's clothing and some of her objects and is lit from within. Uh, whereas the previous one is asking people to kind of adjust their posture and look down to experience the aerial view that the footage was captured at. Um, and in another sense, I've given someone a viewfinder to further immerse their visual aspect and be kind of solely in control of how they're moving through the images and the slides. Some of these uh, pieces are very physical and uh, aggressive in the sense that with the top left, you see the broken glass. Some of them I'm shattering plates and expressing this rage of helplessness wanting to be able to do something to help my mother when I can't. And some of them are much more reflective where you see the flowers that taking from her, where we've held her vigil in her room the weeks leading up to her death. It's much more quiet and having this meditative experience. And so for me, it was important to incorporate both aspects of that, the more aggressive and the more meditative side to the experience so that I could really showcase how unique and contradictory grief can be in an effort to be more fully understood in that experience. So this is another example of that more meditative side. This one um, comes from an example that I've heard um, where people compare grief to a wildfire and say that it clears away all the non-essential in the same way that a wild brush fire would restore the earth and the soil and provide nutrients and clear away the materials that were sucking nutrients away. So I kind of experienced that as well when I was going through early grief where anything that wasn't absolutely essential to getting through the day was just not part of my life anymore. And this is um, the video in question with the uh, meditative, more vigil aspect to the experience of just moving through this quiet waiting space where you're anticipating the loss, but you can't really do much. So you're taking your time and being in the moment as much as possible and kind of holding that space for whatever you're going through and for the person that is about to transition. After spending, I would say the first uh, year, year and a half after my mother had died on these more personal expressions of grief, I started looking more at what the experience was as a caregiver. I had kind of set aside my uh, caregiver trauma in light of the immediacy of grief. And when I revisited it, I realized a lot more about what I had been through and also what a lot of other caregivers go through. So I started a series that was looking at the physical objects that a lot of caregivers find themselves using, especially as death becomes more and more um, imminent in that care um, is expanded, it's intensified, the things that people need support doing for themselves, such as on the right with the bed pads, like you're less likely to be able to get out of bed to use the restroom, you're more likely to need different comforts, such as a heating pad for random aches and pains that come up as complications of medication arise. And I'm looking at these objects from the perspective of how stressful and overwhelming caregiving can be and how often these objects are seen as an additional stressor. You think to yourself, I really wanna have to deal with this cheap piece of plastic that I'm gonna throw away and it just reminds me of all these burdens that have been thrust upon me. But I started looking at it from the perspective of if this object is helping me to better care for my loved one, 
and making their comfort more possible and closer to what is ideal, even if it's still very far from it, then at the end of the day, this object is sacred. And therefore, me as the person using this tool and performing this act of care, I am in a sacred role as well. And so I saw it as a mindfulness practice to think about, though there's many gaps in the medical system to support family caregivers, there are things we can immediately do for ourselves, even just as simple as reconsidering that what we are doing is an honor and is sacred and deserves respect for ourselves and for from others who are witnessing our work. So I've been expanding this further and looking more into a performative aspect more recently and how I can step into that role of physically, what does it look like to receive care from the perspective of end of life care? Obviously there are many different types of caregiving um, for a myriad of circumstances, but end of life care is its own uh, situation. It comes with a unique set of psychological factors and also noting that once the care is finished, the other person is no longer there. And so there's a lot that we can't know about what happens in those final moments, but we can, if we are carefully observing and listening to people as they go through it, we can share some of what that looks like. More recently, I've been expanding my practice to look broadly at cultural practices of mourning. So expanding from the personal to the more uh, insular community of family care to more broadly larger community practices. Um, I think a lot about most people are familiar with the idea of people being buried in a cemetery and you go there to visit and you leave flowers. Um, but I noticed that with cemeteries that we have in the West, there's this one look and it's very solemn and there's a lot of, in my mind, issues with it when it comes to what's good for the environment and what's good for our bodies and what is actually true to our individual cultural practices that we're all bringing to the same cemetery. So I started thinking about why we have this one look for a cemetery in the US and how it could be expanded based on my own experiences and also more broad global research about what else is, is possible and is out there. So I made these gravestones that are out of plants. So mosses and grass and flowers and leaves. And at first I installed them indoors and arranged them in a way that was, they were completely in the shape that they needed to be as an invitation to acknowledge what they already look like, which is the, you know, the common grave markers that we're most familiar with, but then also what they could look like if they were made out of different materials. And this is just one potential option that I'm offering and asking people to think of more. So I tested them indoors and outdoors and they changed over time. And I found that to be in much more in alignment also with my experience of grief. Not only is this something that can be changed in terms of philosophically memorializing someone, but also back to that personal expression of grief when we have those winter seasons of grief or we have the summer seasons of grief where things are, are brighter or more flared or things are more dormant depending on what we're going through in the rest of our lives and how it looks different and when we're at different stages, our relationship to, that, relationship to that person, our relationship to the space that we're in now. And I'm very, very grateful to have been actually given an opportunity to install this outdoors for the first time. So now I'm looking at, well, what does this look like living outside year round? <laughs> I started this mini cemetery in the backyard with um, more moss and, and some succulent grasses and some little shrubs that this one in the back. I hope will grow over the next couple of years and that I can shape it into more of like an obelisk uh, conventional shape, but instead out of a little tree. And I hope that that again is an invitation for people to think about what are their own personal preferences when it comes to uh, mourning and memorialization and that there doesn't need to be this one size fits all. It can be custom to you or your loved one's wishes and that makes it that much more special. And as Amanda mentioned, I also like to incorporate resources into the work that I do. So if I have a show, there's always programming that 
allows people to learn more. I don't like the idea of bringing up a bunch of really big feelings and then just leaving people to deal with them on their own. So this is one example. I'm grateful to be featured in this project called the Artist Grief Deck. It's, uh, it's a deck that was designed by an artist who does tarot cards. And so each of these cards has images on one side collected from artists all over the world. And this front one here is mine. And then on the back side are prompts either given by the same artist. So I gave a prompt describing that piece and like what it meant to me. Um, or there's also prompts by poets or writers talking about different aspects of grief. So you can see here on this one, it's talking about time and perspective. There's others on healing. There's others on relating to others. And the nice thing about this tool is that it came out at the, at the very beginning of COVID where people were looking for resources that they could use on their own. And this is a great one to use in isolation or with others if they are around you, but it makes it more versatile and accessible. So there's also a website version. So you don't have to buy a deck if you don't want to, or if you don't have the funds to pay for one, you can access the entire deck online at um, artistgriefdeck.com. And a big part of how I lead these workshops that I, that I offer resources to is through the study of death work. So I recently completed a, a formal course for becoming a death doula. I like to think that my firsthand experience was caring for my mother. I provided a lot of emotional, spiritual, and physical care for her that really aligns with the practices of doulas. But the nice thing about this program is that it allowed me to look at it from a more objective standpoint, thinking about caring for someone who's not my personal uh, kin who might have different needs and desires and wishes than I'm used to and how to be fully capable of providing that um, support. And so I incorporate a lot of those lessons into my workshops to give people a more accessible entry point into what it looks like to plan for end of life, whether they know that there's a terminal illness to consider or whether that's not something they're going to be thinking about for a while, but they want to start the planning ahead of time which I always advocate for, planning early and often. <laughs> and I also like to um, allow people to share their stories. I've had a lot of people come up to me at shows or after um, virtual sharings, and they just start telling me how they have these similar stories that really the, the work opened up a space for them to talk about, maybe for the first time. And sometimes those conversations are really beautiful in person, and we can really just have a moment together. Other times, there's not a moment for us to connect. So I leave the online portal open for people to share whenever they feel, however they feel, as a way to have their stories heard um, in terms of us sharing, and then having that knowledge, that firsthand story be incorporated into the perspectives that I bring into new work. Because I know my story, but grief is a very unique and expansive experience. For everyone. And so I like to make sure that the work that I make is not just focused on how I feel about things, but how the larger conversation with grief is evolving culturally. So those are my slides for now. I'm sure we'll get into some questions, but thank you for being here again. And I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the discussion evolve. Thank you, Brianna. That was wonderful. It's it's a really enlightening uh, to hear you talk about your work and how your work has evolved over the years and through your experience with your mom. So thank you. I'm so grateful. And I'm sure everyone here is too. I'm continuously, like multiple times in our planning process, I've been pleasantly surprised by sort of the parallelness of your story and Melissa's story and how um, you know, death is not something that anyone chooses to experience the death of a loved one, but when it happens, you then choose what you're going to do with it. And I think that that is a nice lead into Melissa's story. And so Melissa, I'll pass it over to you to share. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. And Brianna, thank you for sharing your story and, and your life experiences and professional experiences. Um, I, I feel so grateful to be in community with other people who have experienced loss. 
And so thank you to GVSU for um, hosting such a tremendous exhibition where we can actually normalize and discuss something that all of us as human beings will inevitably encounter at some point in our lives. Some of us encounter grief and loss earlier, some of us later in life, but all living beings at some point who open themselves up to love another person open themselves up to also experiencing grief and loss. So, um, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I come to this presentation with both personal and professional experience. Um, and so I'm looking forward to just kind of sharing my, my personal story first with all of you, and then leading into sort of my professional experience and, and how, how my personal story reflects um, the work that I do. And um, I will say that my, my professional work is my offering to others. And it's been so, um, so life affirming actually to see other individuals offerings of their grief experience. So while I don't have um, any objects or art or tangible things to show, I really view my, my private practice and my office spaces as a blank canvas for whoever enters into that space. So on a personal standpoint, standpoint um, I'll just kind of go through my, my history. So in 2005, um, I was married. I had two children, six-year-old daughter, three-year-old son. I was pregnant with my third. Um, and I worked at that time as a early interventionist in a school system. And my husband worked as a director of special education. We were, we were busy. Our life was full, raising two kids. Um, we were anticipating um, our third, another little boy. Um, and so on April 1st of 2005, um, I delivered our son, Isaac. And um, unbeknownst to us, because he was beautiful and perfect in every way as soon as he was born, he was born with a congenital heart defect, which had gone undetected during pregnancy. Um, so as soon as he entered the world, instead of those of you who are, are parents or who have been through the birthing experience, oftentimes as soon as the baby's born, the baby's placed in the mother's arms and you have the opportunity to see your child and smell your child and experience them finally for like being earth side. And so, Isaac's birth was different because as soon as he was born, he was whisked away to a little incubator and um, the nursing staff right away was, was attending to him. Um, and so in the course of a few hours, he was sent from um, our local hospital to Bronson Hospital in Kalamazoo, where he was diagnosed with his congenital heart defect. And then airlifted via helicopter to Ann Arbor. So I checked myself out of the, the hospital. Um, we followed the ambulance to Kalamazoo, got the news in Kalamazoo and watched as the helicopter took him away. The next day, my husband and I made sure we had care for our two other children um, and we drove to Ann Arbor where Isaac stayed in the NICU for five days. Um, he had his open heart surgery on April 6th. And during the course of the surgery, the surgeons realized that he had multiple other minor heart defects, but that his heart was more impaired than what they had originally thought. And so Isaac died during his surgery. Um, and so that, sent both of us, my husband and I, down kind of the beginning stages of this grief journey. And so leaving the hospital, I remember feeling both this like heaviness and emptiness at the same time. So, um, and not really knowing what to do with it, not, not knowing how to talk to our other two living children about this. Um, they never had an opportunity to meet Isaac. Um, so it, it forced us to have 
multiple conversations with our young kids um, and also conversations, the two of us in terms of our own unique experiences of, of, of the death of Isaac. Um, so I was fortunate at that time that a dear friend connected me with a Catholic nun who actually was also um, a therapist and her name of all things was Sister Joy. And she held space for me um, in a way that I really, I really needed and helped me to grieve the loss of Isaac. And so I met with her um, several times for a period of about two or three months. Um, and was finally starting to feel that veil or cloak of, of, of grief, that, that dark, heavy fog of grief lift. Um, and so in July, three months later, my family um, was vacationing up north at our family's cottage, uh, my husband's family's cottage. And we were excited to spend the week away. It just felt like a perfect opportunity to regroup, to be near water, to be together. Um, and so on a, on a hot, humid, sunny sun, summer day um, on July 24th, my 35 year old husband um, died unexpectedly of a, of a sudden heart attack. Um, and so I was left kind of re-wearing that cloak of, of grief and, and, and from a, an even more devastated place, um, having lost two significant people in my life in such a short period of time. And also feeling then like I needed to help carry my children's grief following the loss of not just their infant brother, but now their father as well. Um, so we, at that time, were able to connect with a former professor of mine from the University of Michigan who actually had moved to, retired as a professor, lived in Kalamazoo, which was about an hour from where we lived at the time. I reached out to him because um, he had a specialty in working with children, explained our situation. He said, I'd love to see you. So for a period of a couple of years, the three of us would pack in the car from St. Joseph, Michigan, drive to Kalamazoo and do grief therapy. Um, and that was one of the greatest gifts that I think the three of us ever had. And what, what this gentleman did for us was he honored each of our individual griefs, but also recognized that we had this collective grief experience. So there were times where he would just see me, there were times where he would just see my daughter, just see my son, times where he would see the, my two kids together, the three of us together. So he was very instrumental in holding that sacred space for us as we grieved. Um, so, in 2006, I moved to Grand Rapids with my children to be closer to family. Um, I grew up in Holland, Michigan. My in-laws, I um, lived in Grand Rapids. My kids have cousins that grew up in Grand Rapids. So I knew that if we were going to move, um, well, first of all, I didn't want to move right away. I wanted to give it a year. Um, and then when we moved, I knew I wanted to be closer to family. I felt like that was something necessary that the three of us needed. So we did that. And so I've been here since 2006. Um, I have since remarried and together we also welcomed a son um, who is now 13. So um, that is the, that's the personal aspect of of grief and loss that I bring into the professional side of what I do. So professionally, I'm a clinical social worker. Um, I, I held a school social work subspecialty, which allowed me to work in the schools. Um, I had over 20 years of, of, of school social work experience, the last six of which were spent in an elementary school building. And one of the things that I noticed and, and realized during that time, was that during those six years, 
our school family experienced the death of a parent, a child. So a child experienced the, the death of a parent every year, at least one that I was the school social worker. And so I found myself supporting students individually um, on their own grief journeys, and then was able to also create like a little grief support group for them during my years there. Um, and about four years ago, I left the public school system um, to pursue private practice. And so a significant part of what I currently offer in my practice, like Amanda said, is grief counseling. And while I see primarily children, adolescents, young adults, I also see um, other adults who are widows or, or who are on their own grief journeys. And so when I was thinking about this, this talk and what I could offer, I know that Amanda kind of gave me some little markers of things that might be helpful. Um, and so some of the things that I have learned along my own individual grief journey is that grief really hurts. And so there's a reason why we use the term heartbroken because it's real. Um, and it, grief is exhausting and all consuming at times. So I, I love that analogy that Brianna shared of like the brush fire, right? So when you are in the acute phases of grief, it, 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 it very much feels like, like that brush fire, like it's all, all consuming, all, all encompassing. Um, and that grief is directly correlated with love. So when we when we love someone, like I said, then we open ourselves up to losing that person um, or to eventually having to say goodbye to that person. Um, the other thing that I've learned is grief is not linear. It doesn't follow this like pattern or these steps. And I know that for years, especially in the field of psychology, so much of like this grief model was predicated on the work of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And some of you may be familiar with her. She was a Swiss American psychiatrist who talked about these five stages of grief, um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And so in our very Western way, we assumed that like those stages were linear and you had to go through each one, almost like a little checkbox. And then, okay, I went through that stage. So now I'm moving on to the next. And what we know now is that grief is not linear. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. That um, while those who find themselves in the throes of grief and loss may experience each of those, it doesn't necessarily mean that they go hand in hand together, like that one precedes the other. And sometimes it actually means that they're kind of intermingled and it's more of a, a tangled web of all of that. Um, so at different times also, I think we may find ourselves thrust back into some of those emotions. We might be thrust back into that anger. We might be thrust back into that like depression and not necessarily in a clinical way, but more in that like sad awareness way of, of the, the, the passage of time without the person who we lost. Um, so in my, in my experience, like there's no, um, there's no greater sacredness than holding space, I think, for someone who is grieving um, and being able to offer that companionship and that reassurance and that connection um, while they move through their emotions, whatever those emotions are. So what helped me be able to do that was finding a community of people. You know, I, I mentioned Sister Joy. Um, Doug Davies was the professor of mine from, from Michigan. Um, I, was, I was connected with a, a, a Reiki massage therapist. And, you know, those of you who have experienced grief know how that can land in your body, right? And, and so we, we physically sometimes carry our grief. And so being able to 
move our bodies in different way or experience touch that allows kind of the the re-energetic flow, right, of, of being able to release some of those emotions. That was incredibly healing for me. Um, I, I appreciated um, prayer. You know, there were times that I, that I couldn't pray, um, but I knew that there were people who were praying for me and, and that, felt, that felt okay to me. Um, so whatever, whatever, I guess, feels right to you, do that, right? But find your people, find people who um, are willing to sit with you um, and, and don't need to solve anything for you or don't need to fix it, right? Um, so in many ways, being able to share my story is one of also the most healing tools that I have ever discovered and, and one of the most powerful tools, I think. So, you know, when we can, when we can name our loved ones, when we can talk about them by name, um, it, it means that they were, it means that they lived, right? And so I, I think that in Western society, we oftentimes have this philosophy that like, okay, you know, they lived, they died, we're moving on. And I talk a lot about like, it's not a moving on, it's a moving forward. And we can move forward in a way that honors our loved ones. And I think sometimes even culturally, you know, we can allow for bringing our loved ones with us differently than if they were here on earth with us. But I do think there is space for being able to recognize like we carry our loved ones with us still to this day, just differently. Um, so in terms of like how grief has changed over time or how, like not just for me, but what I hear other people say as well, um, is I once heard this analogy of like grief and pain in a box. And so like, if you think about like, there's a pain button in a box, right? And so early on in grief, grief is so big. It's, almost, it's like this big ball that encompasses almost the entire box. So that ball is constantly pushing up against that pain button. Over time, grief grows smaller, but the pain button is still there. So there may be times like anniversaries, certain songs, certain smells, certain places that hold significant memories where that, that grief ball is, is, is bumping up against that pain button again, but it happens less frequently and with less, um, with less severity almost, but it never goes away. So that was just a really, I think, helpful analogy for me. And I think that, you know, remembering details for me of Isaac and John's death sometimes feels like just yesterday. Like I, I can vividly remember certain smells. I can vividly remember where I was at certain times. And yet it also feels like forever ago at the same time. So time is a, time is a strange thing. Um, and so there, there is no cure for grief um, and there's no point in which it ever goes away. I guess the way I choose to describe it is it just becomes less pointed, you know? Um, and so in terms of what can I share with others maybe who are new to grief or who find themselves continuing to unpack um, grief either for the first time or maybe like myself, you've experienced like multiple losses. Brianna said this as well, like each person's grief experience is so unique. Um, and so there's no right or wrong way to grieve, you know? And, and I think when I listened to the artists talk, um, whenever if that was January or February, I don't remember, but like a couple months ago, probably. Um, I just feel like, you know, hearing them talk about you know, how their work, their art was in a, a way for them to express their emotions and also remain connected to their loved ones. Um, that, that is really 
that is really what grief is, right? It, it's finding meaning in our loss and hopefully being able to share that with others in a way that isn't our grief superseding theirs, but more from a place of like, if you encounter somebody who has been in a similar spot in a forest, right? It's sort of like, okay, I've been there too. And I can, I can sit with you in the forest and I can also help you find hope in the wilderness, right? And so that's what I feel like I heard from Brianna today and I heard from the artists um, who were part of the, the exhibition. Um, so I talk a lot about grief coming and going like waves especially with kids, but I think for adults too, I think that's also a, a descriptor that most people can understand, right? Where sometimes it feels like there's kind of that undercurrent and the waves are manageable and you're kind of like riding them just fine. And then other times it can feel like a, a big tsunami, right? And, and our goal is really to be able to get to the other side. And eventually just like a wave, it does crash over, right? So if we can ride out those waves of grief, and be able to get to shore again, um, that is really reassuring. So um, our wounds become potentially our gifts if we're open to it. Um, and so I guess I appreciate um, being able to share in and understand the grief of others, both in, in conversations like this and, and certainly in individual conversations that I have with my clients. So it's an invitation really um, to common humanity. So thank you for letting me share my story um, with all of you today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Melissa. I'm going to pause for just a second and invite everybody just to take a collective deep breath. I think this is a lot to take in. I fully recognize that. And I want to just encourage everyone to breathe for a moment uh, before we open it up to questions. Um, I also want to share in the chat that GVSU's Counseling Center has some great resources for grief and loss, and they provide individual grief counseling. They also have a, a group, um, like a grief counseling group that you can join if that's something that you feel will help. Um, yeah, so thank you to Melissa and Brianna. I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, there were a couple questions that, and, and just thoughts that came through my mind as you were talking. Um, and I see Renee has her hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and let Renee jump in. And then if things kind of pause or um, quiet down, then I'll, I'll ask my questions. Renee, go ahead. I had to look a little bit better. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, okay. So, oh my gosh, thank you so much to both of you. This has been just, I could sit here all day and listen to people talk about, um, I guess for me, it's really about love. And in the end is like, all of it is about love. Um, and I just start vibrating and I get really excited and I, I know it's a weird thing to get excited about, but, um, it's just been such a part of my life, you know, having lost my dad when I was a child and then later in life, my brother and other family members. So it feels like it is the essential part of living is that yes, you will lose someone. And for me, I'm starting my course to become a death doula. And so we have to watch a lot of videos and there's this term that I absolutely love, which is called holding space. And I, I guess I'm just really curious where that term comes from. Is it a, you know, key term that people use or is it, how do, does anybody have any history of it? Because you both use the word. And then when I watch videos um, with my studies, that word is used a lot and it's used a lot in the text. Um, so the word, the, two, the well, the, the group of words just bring to mind so much, um, visual things that I can think about making art about as well. So. Um, so I can jump in and just, I, I don't know the exact origins of it, Renee, other than um, I certainly see it in 
like the field of psychology, like it's, it's written about, it's talked about. I do feel also, cause I've done some, some trainings and work in, in mindfulness meditation. And I think that it does, um, it does come up in, in that kind of, um, uh, specialty as well, right? Where we're holding space for our thoughts or we're holding space for like the way, um, our bodies are feeling. So I don't, I don't know its original orientation though. Um, other than for me, when I use it like you, it just lands in such a way that, um, just feels very descriptive. I don't know if you have other thoughts on that, Brianna. I actually, I don't know the exact origin either, but I've heard it across many of the fields that I've worked in. I've heard it in the death fuel space. I've also, like you said, heard it in the mindfulness space. Originally, actually heard it more in um, um, equity inclusion workspaces where we're trying to look at um, making sure everyone feels safe, that their identities will not be um, discriminated and also that they can share concerns. So, so that was the first place I heard it, holding space for those conversations to happen in a safe way. But I don't know the origins either. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for that question, Renee. Leah, would you like to ask something? Can you yes, y'all are making me um, think of like with the holding space question, you all are just made, like the thing that I thought of um, immediately was the bell hooks quote, like, you know, the rarely if ever are any of us healed in isolation, healing is an act of communion. So I almost take out of, I mean, usually when I'm thinking about any concept that's come from like clinical spaces, it probably came from indigenous people before. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's my uh, best guess, but also just that quote uh, and bell hooks, like so much healing and, you know, we're talking about love um, and bell hooks was all about love too. So um, yeah, any excuse to say that quote. So that's, that was my thought <laughs> of where it might originate from. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. I love that perspective. Yeah, I think the importance, I even wrote down like importance of community on this little post-it. I think that's one of the things that really resonated when I was listening to both of you speak. Um, I'm just going to keep talking. If anyone else is interested, please uh, use the raise hand or drop into the chat. Um, I, I do want to ask um, or point out, sorry, Renee, uh, Brianna, one of the things that came to mind as you were sharing your work was the similarity to some of the work we have in the gallery that was created by Adrian Grafton when you were taking those little plastic objects that were part of your caregiving experience. Um, it, it occurred to me that I've seen that or that general idea of taking um, common objects or objects that don't seem to carry any huge significance. Um, and turning them into something that feels highly significant or special or almost otherworldly. And in the gallery, um, I didn't share this on a slide. You maybe saw it in a video. Adrian took her mother's cosmetics and she dipped them or painted onto them with plaster. So they have this like ghostly, uh, but also sort of sacred quality to them. And then I think about, you know, my own experiences in grieving or just being in a stressful or, or traumatic situation and random objects, things you would never expect to come across in your day-to-day -day have these like instantaneous significance and importance like forever. Like I think about um, just like, I, don't, I can't even think of an example, but it's one of those things where like if I were to be out in the world and I run across this object or this color or something, I'll be instantly reminded of an event that happened. Um, so that got my line of thinking started and led me to this question. Um, and I don't know that there's a simple answer to this, so I apologize if there's not, but in your day-to-day, -day, as you're moving through the world, if you are surprised by grief or you know, taken off guard, do either of you have any tools or any way to move through that? experience and just get on with your day. 
I actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked this because I think something that came up during our previous discussion in preparation for this um, is important to bring back, which is this idea that like having these strong emotions come up is somehow like a thing to be avoided. Um, I fully embrace like just crying it out and, and expressing like in this video where I'm shattering place, I'm just like expressing this rage and, and you know, it, it's not shying away from the honesty of what the experience is. In my mind, like having those emotions doesn't mean that something is more wrong. Like there's already something bad happening, right? Um, and so expressing them is just that catharsis and that release and allowing yourself to be honest with yourself and those around you about what you're really dealing with and that not doing that actually worse and, and turn those feelings back onto ourselves and, and compound the pain that we're in. So if something comes up for me, I just go with whatever that feeling is. Like I, I think I shared the example of going into Target and I see something and I think, I want to get that for her. It's perfect. And then a second later, I'm like, oh yeah, I can't because she's dead. And then I'm like in crying in Target, you know, and it's okay. Like, you know what? I'm around strangers. I'm wearing a mask. Nobody's going to know who I am. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm going to cry for a minute. That's fine. And whatever comes next, like if I need to like take a detour in my day and just uh, have some calm time to the side, like that's what needs to happen. And now obviously everybody's schedules are different. That's not always like, possible, but I just embrace whatever it looks like in that moment. I try to hold that space in, on days that I know will be really significant and on days where uh, buffered around <laughs> those big times, just in case there's like overflow, you know, not necessarily trying to make grief fit my day, but blend them together, you know? Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. I'll just, I'll just piggyback on, on what Brianna said, because I completely agree with everything she just said. And um, I think that, you know, grief is meant to be felt just like any other emotion. So I think that, um, unfortunately, it's one of those emotions that we do tend to sometimes brace ourselves against or think like, oh, I don't wanna feel that because it doesn't feel good to grieve, right? And yet the reality is, like we've talked about, if we think about grief as an expression of love, right? Allowing yourself to let that emotion come up and as emotions do. And if we don't, then they're in all likelihood going to come out in more unhealthy ways, right? We find ways to numb ourselves. We find ways to stuff those emotions. Um, and so like Brianna, like if I find myself driving down the road, right? And a song comes on or I see something and it triggers like a wave of that grief. One of the things that I have found to be most helpful is that self-compassion, right? So offering myself that self-compassion. Sometimes I'll even put my hand on my heart and I'll say, this really hurts. I really miss John or I really miss Isaac or I, I wish I would have had this experience with them, right? So truly just extending that grace and compassion to ourselves that we're so much better at extending to other people, right? So just allowing the, the moment to come because to Brianna's point, she can be in target. I could be anywhere. I can have a moment of grief. And then the next moment, like I'm, I'm on with the rest of my day. Sometimes if it goes longer then I, I just take more time to just sit in those emotions, realizing that they're not going to swallow me up. Right. So, um, I agree. Just that self-compassion in those moments, I think, is the biggest thing. Thank you. Um, we'll do Renee and then Allison. Um, I wanted to um, ask Brianna about, um, I also noticed in the videos that I was kind of required to watch that um, a lot of death doulas are also artists. And so I wonder if you could maybe comment on that connection between being an artist and a death doula and how that's kind of impacted you. You talked a little bit about how caring for your mom um, and being her caretaker, well, I don't want to say caretaker, but you know, 
end of life support. Um, but how, how do you think the art played into that? That's so interesting here because I haven't, I, I, if you know who these other artists death doulas are, please introduce me. I've been trying to find them. Um, so it's uh, interesting to hear that from the other side that you've seen that because I've been, um, I'm still trying to connect. But um, for me, like I've been an artist my entire life. And so the art always comes first and the art is always the place where I uh, deal with things and talk about things and, and try to form entry points for a lot of different topics and, and concepts. Um, and so uh, when I started, after my mother died and I started making work about caring for her and the experience of, of grieving her, I was researching a lot um, personally in my own grief, like what are things as a griever? And I was researching a lot as an artist, like just out of that curiosity that's in my studio practice of what else does this larger topic mean? Um, globally and communally and and where do I fit into all and so I was researching from two different perspectives at the same time and I as I was looking up more and more research on caregiving because my experience as a caregiver was very traumatic partially not entirely but partially because I had no idea what I was getting into until it was happening <laughs> um, I found out about uh, death doulas in a book that was talking about caregiving and I realized there was a lot there that would have been helpful for me to know, like if somebody like that had shared what I was supposed to expect, what I tools I could use to, to work through it in a more fluid way. And so I was reading more and eventually I was like, well, I feel like I'm kind of doing bits of this. Like I did a lot of this for my mother. I'm doing bits of this in my art practice by sharing resources with people through the work. Um, so why don't I just pursue it? So that's how I got to the death doula track via the arts. But I'd love to know, <laughs> like, where are the other artist death doulas are because I want to connect. <laughs> but it sounds like you're about to be one as well. So. Yeah, I hope just as a volunteer. So, um, but I, I mean, I always think about like the act of making art is an act of empathy, and so I know that, you know, those two have like strong connections um, to one another. But yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Renee. Yeah, Allison, go ahead. Okay. Oh, hi. So I just wanted to step back to the um, the saving space um, phrase that Renee brought up, and that definitely think it's a contemporary term, and um, like you all were saying, in that. You know, it's been brought up with, I've heard it lots of times with mindfulness or um, an equity training, things like that. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sad that it is a contemporary, more contemporary term because like when I was trying to grieve for the loss of my grandparents that I was super close to, my grandma in 2007 and my grandpa in 2014, I felt like my family was like they robbed me of that space uh, to have grief because they were so concerned about not getting too emotional or like, you know, like it was just, it was just awkward. Like there was no there was no saving space type of phrases that ever um, were were set. It was more about just shooshing things away and like moving forward. And so I feel like I've never properly grieved for for them. And I, as a mom, I just want to make sure that I don't do that to to my son. And I, you know, from what I'm hearing with you, with the advice I can give, um, it sounds like using that phrase for sure but I also want to have a healthier environment for my rest of my family that is you know quick to rob rob us of that of that space and so I just wanted to um go a little further on any advice for um that you could that you could provide of you know how do we how do we help encourage family members who you know, no offense, but like boomers who are used to not expressing <laughs> um, their emotions and also, you know, aren't the people who will go to therapy, you know, willingly to be able to deal with grief. I just, I think I need some language that can help like ease 
these kind of suggestions into these types of conversations to have a healthier um, grieving experience. I totally hear you. I know it can be hard, certain family members just not initially even being open to talking about things. And so it's hard to know where to start. I will add a disclaimer here, like everybody, just like everybody agrees differently, everybody approaches talking about death differently. And so there's no guarantee that someone will open up, even if you use like the perfect language. But um, I've been uh, collecting some resources that I've found to be helpful. One of them is um, the Conversation Project. It's a website that has free downloadable PDFs where you can have a guide to a number of conversations regarding end of life. And they also have ones to just yourself for starting that conversation with someone you know who's going to be like sensitive to it. Um, so there's that, and then in a more in a more fun and less um, a less pressure approach, there's this um, game called the Death Deck. I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but hold on, let me see if I can grab it really quick. This little um, oh. You can't, can you see it? The death deck, <laughs> like my blur function is working a little too hard. Um, it's this deck of cards that has um, little prompts on it about death and end of life. And some of them are, well, you can't really see it that way. Anyway, some of them are multiple choice. Some of them are more open-ended. And it's just like a fun game night game that has lighthearted questions and serious questions mixed in. So it's not all one-sided of like, we're going to sit down and have this intense conversation right now. It's like, no, we're just playing a card game and some of it might get serious and some of it might not. And you don't have to answer everything, but I think it can open some doors. And there are other resources like that out there, but those are two that I found help start those conversations. Um, like I said, not everybody will be open to it, even if you use every perfect phrase, but they're good places to start. So I think that's a really great question, Allison. And, and I think just the fact that you're thinking about it from your children's perspective and wanting them to have a different experience at being able to safely express their emotions, whatever they may be, um, be comes from your experience of growing up, right? And not being able to do that. So the fact that you're even, um, thinking along those lines lends me to believe that like you're parenting your children differently right and, and there there's not a right or wrong way it's just that but you know I was raised very similarly to you where feelings weren't talked about right especially the uncomfortable ones um and so I have I have a ton of resources actually for kids um and I, if there's a way that I could even get your like email or something, I'd be happy to share some of those. There's some really great, really great books for kids. Um, and I could share those. And then also some little, some little like um, Q and kind of like the death deck, but like similar, like Q and a things for kids um, as well as some little like grief workbooks. I mean, I use a lot of art with my kid clients because sometimes making things, drawing things is easier for them than being able to describe what they're feeling. Um, so I'm happy to share any, any of those resources if, if that would be helpful for you. But I do think for you to be able to talk with your children even about what you're feeling, that normalizes for them like, oh, if mom can feel sad sometimes talking about grandma and grandpa, or um, then that allows me to talk about other times that I feel sad, right? So we become these models for our kids in allowing them to safely and, and healthily express emotions. That's yeah, thank you. Amanda can get you my email address. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you. Better yet, Melissa, if you're comfortable sharing those with me, I can drop them into an email. I don't know if all of that Perfect. is something we can easily email, but then I can share it with the rest of our attendees today. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Great. Share the yeah. love. 
Um, is there anyone that has a quick last question? We're about 10 minutes over at this point, so I don't want to keep anyone if you have something up next on your calendar. All right, then we'll wrap it up. Thank you to all of our attendees. Giant thank you to uh, Brianna and Melissa. Um, so grateful for your stories and your answers to all of our questions. Um, Karen's asking if I can provide contact info. Yeah, Brianna and Melissa, if you're comfortable with me sharing your contact information with our attendees today, I can do that. I'll check in with you via email afterwards. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat too. So I know that all of our attendees are really grateful for your presentations today. All right, have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. I never know how long to stay on, you know? It's like, does anybody want to talk to me? I don't know. <laughs> I just wanted to, oh, I thought I was still on mute. I just wanted to say thanks again for, you know, having us and inviting me. I'm, like, it's awesome to be part of this. And this show seems amazing. I wish I could do it in person, but um, it's just really cool to be part of the programming for it. So thanks. Well, for I'm, yeah, you're very welcome. I'm just thrilled you said yes. This is great. <laughs> and it's it's really cool to see all of the things that you're involved with now because I like you know started responding or like liking your things on Instagram you show up for me all the time now thank you algorithm <laughs> I know right <laughs> yeah so I'll, be afraid. I'll just be looking out for all the cool things you do in the future looking out and let <laughs> me know when you're in New York yeah oh man I would love to just leave the state <laughs> that'd be great <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hit me up. Seriously, it'd be cool to hang out again. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, I'll talk right. to you later. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.